Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes here, one or two minutes, just for some final people to join, and then we'll get started. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our South America Gap Semester, Gap Pre-Semester Briefing. We appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening, and I hope this webinar proves helpful as you finalize everything for your upcoming Gap Semester. My name is Margot Brookfield, and I am the Gap Director here at ARC Gap. I've had the pleasure of interacting with all of you as we've prepared for this fall, and I've thoroughly enjoyed interviewing our students and getting to know them more. A little bit more about me, I've been with ARC for six years now. I started out as a leader in 2015, including leading our Latin America and East Africa GAP semester programs before transitioning into the office full-time in January 2017. Since joining the office, I've had the opportunity to direct our South America, Himalaya, Central Caribbean, and Northwest GAP semester programs. Building, scouting, and designing these programs has been a true joy, and having traveled extensively to all of the regions that you will be traveling to this fall, I am excited for the adventures that you have in store. With me here tonight is Emily Rosser, who works with me on the GAP team as another of our GAP directors. She has been with ARC for two and a half years now, directing our Asia and Hawaii semesters, and also used to lead year-long GAP, GAP programs for another GAP company. So she will be online today answering questions throughout the presentation and is well informed with the details of this program and happy to help. You will also see pictured here Sophia Weeks, who is our Executive Director of GAP programs. She has been with ARC for 11 years now and actually led our first ever GAP semester in East Africa in 2011. She has since built and designed all of our GAP semesters and currently directs our Southwest, East Africa, and Pacific Islands semesters. So before we begin, I would like to go over a little housekeeping for those of you who are new to webinars. We've put everyone's phones on mute, so you can hear us, but we can't hear you. We have many people on the line tonight, so this helps keep background noise at a minimum. However, this is meant to be an interactive experience, so if you do have a question, you'll notice a box on your webinar dashboard that says questions or chat. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the box and Emily will get back to you with an answer. If it is a question that many people are asking, Emily will pass it on to me and I will go over it at the end of the presentation. As a quick note, I will be covering a lot this evening, so I do encourage you to hold your questions until the end as I will likely go over it. So tonight we are going to go over some pre-program preparation, travel to and from your ARC semester, um, more specific semester-specific information, um, some questions, and then also follow-up communications for the semester ahead. So starting with pre-semester preparation. Um, all right, so what does ARC expect of me? While there are no experiences that are required or um, you know, admissions requirements for an ARC program, there are a few critical attributes that we would like to see our students bring with them on the program. So a big one is a positive and easygoing attitude, which really ties in with the flexibility here. They do go hand in hand, but even in pre-COVID times, international travel can change a lot. And while I've done a lot to make this a great itinerary for you, the bus might not come on time. Um, there might not be enough tools at a project you're working on. And as we all know at this point with COVID, things are subject to change these days. So we do expect you to just um, you know, be flexible with us, be ready to kind of roll with those punches as they come. Often some of the most amazing experiences in travel arise when things happen that you don't quite expect, but it often uh, um, brings up an opportunity that you might not have anticipated that can be just as, if not more fulfilling. So, um, you know, additionally to that, this is a small group and each student plays a really key role in the group dynamic and the experience of everybody else. So one bad egg, a bad egg or negative Nelly really can impact everyone. So we do encourage you to keep that flexibility and positive attitude. Um, additionally, active and enthusiastic participation. So we expect you to come in ready to engage, to ask questions, to really dive into all that the semester offers. You will get so much more out of this if you are willing to 
jump in if there's an opportunity to do something new or different or try that, you, you know, unique food, whatever it might be, you will get so much more out of this and also set an example and create that culture within your group to, you know, say yes to opportunities and participate in the program fully and be the person that you want to be. Additionally, a willingness to learn. So as you all should know now, we've talked to you about it in your interviews. There is a curriculum in place on this program. It is an educational experience. And I've done a lot to set up these hands-on opportunities for you all so that you can get the hands-on experiences and really have an immersive semester. Um, but we need you to come in willing to dig deep and be a part of group discussions and um, all that comes along with the course reader and the curriculum as a whole. Um, additionally, a dedication to completing group and independent projects. So um, as, yes, with that curriculum, we do have our Capstone Passion Project that will be a part of this for you to, um, you know, engage in that, to complete that project, to complete service projects, um, doing the reflective field assignments, journal prompts, interviews, all of those things combined. What documents do you need to travel? So obviously you need a passport, you're heading internationally please confirm that your passport does not expire before May 10th of 2022. Um, both Ecuador, especially Ecuador, if not Peru as well, require at least six months validity on your passport after you arrive back to the United States from your travel. So that is an important piece to keep in mind. If you need to renew your passport, I highly recommend getting that process going as soon as possible. At this point, you would probably need to go to um, an emergency passport. I do think there's a few of you who are already on this um, Doing that, which is great, doing the emergency passport, um, you can get a same-day passport if you're in that boat. But uh, yeah, please make sure it doesn't expire before then. Um, please bring a copy of your passport as well. We do have those on file through the portal, um, but I encourage you to bring a copy as well and pack it separately from your passport in the event that you lose it. Um, and you also are going to need the, to bring the hard copy of your COVID-19 vaccination card. So I know that these are a little bit daunting to travel with. We only get one. I highly recommend laminating it. Um, your instructors are going to be collecting passports as well as COVID-19 vaccination cards. I, they wanted the Miami airport to ensure that those do not get lost. But in order to enter Ecuador without a quarantine, you will need to have that vaccination card. So very, very important. So will you need shots or vaccinations for this program? Hopefully by now you've seen the health, um, health precautions form on the online portal. There are no required immunizations for this program outside of that COVID-19 vaccination. So you will need to make sure that you have that and are at least two weeks out of your um, second dose of whatever, if it's a two-shot vaccine. Um, but otherwise, these are just recommendations from the CDC. So we've outlined these here. It's really up to you to talk to your travel doctor or your physician to figure out what um, you know, what preventative measures you're wanting to take, what feels right for you. Um, these are kind of what we recommend based on the CDC. I know there's been some questions about malaria prophylaxis and how much you would need to bring. You are only going to be in a low risk malarial zone in the Amazon for roughly 10 days of the semester. So um, unless you're wanting to, for some reason, there's no need to take those prophylaxis for the full two and a half months that you're traveling um, just for however long before and after the malarial potential exposure zone um, is typically what they do. Um, you know, other like boosters of these, we do recommend getting your flu shot. Um, and these are some of the other, you know, kind of, yeah, recommendations for this region from the CDC. Additionally, we do recommend a mini personal med kit. Your instructors are going to be traveling with a very extensive med kit during the program, but there are some things that are just good to have on hand for yourself. So one of those that we do recommend is a probiotic. That does help a lot just with being exposed to new bacteria, different foods, different waters and such. It does help to kind of keep your gut biome in a good place. So acidophilus is a great one that you can get over the counter. Um, I do recommend one, obviously, that would not need refrigeration during the program as that will be a little bit harder to come by, but um, something that doesn't need refrigeration is a probiotic. Um, Imodium and Pepto-Bismol for kind of both ends of the spectrum, you, there's a good chance you might have some traveler sickness is what we see the most of um, while traveling in this region, especially. So, you know, just kind of diarrhea, things like that. So Imodium can help if you have a travel day or something. Um, Pepto is always good to have. Those electrolyte packets are great, emergency or rehydration salts. Um, you know, for if you for some reason are feeling dehydrated, that's always good to have. I personally like liquid IVs, another one that you can do that's just a powder that you put in your water. Um, some Tylenol or ibuprofen, um, wet wipes for if you have a longer stint in between shower opportunities, um, some tissues, motion sickness meds are really just for if you are prone to motion sickness, um, Benadryl if you do have allergies, 
Um, we do recommend for this program that students bring an antibiotic, and this is something you would need a prescription for, but ciprofloxacin is something that you can get that's just um, a few days course of antibiotic that's really helpful if you do have traveler sickness and are in a more remote location, um, then you could take that as opposed to doing a clinic visit, see if that can knock it out. Obviously, we would communicate with families before students start the ciprofloxacin in any circumstance, so we would be communicating with you first. Um, hand sanitizer, some band-aids, band and some extra masks are always good to have on hand, and you would want to have those for this program. So what type of luggage do you need? Um, so I hope we've all looked at the packing list at this point. We are going to talk about that. I know there's some concerns of, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff. How do I make it all fit? How am I going to make it fit in these, you know, these two small pieces of luggage? So there are no rolling suitcases allowed on this program. You are going to be traveling over rocky terrain. You know, you need to be able to fit all of your gear on your person. So the way that would work is that you'd have your big backpack as pictured here on your back, your little backpack on your front, your day pack or school backpack on your front um, for airport days, for, you know, traveling to and from the bus, to your accommodations, et cetera. It is crucial that you have a backpacking backpack as pictured here with hip straps. You are doing a three-day trek on this program in Peru, and so you need to be able to carry your gear on your back. For that trek, to be clear, you will not be carrying everything you brought with you, just the essentials for the purposes of the trek. You will store the rest of your gear um, behind at a hotel. Um, but yes, the shoulder straps and waist belt are crucial. Um, we recommend a 70 to 80 liter backpack for that. Um, and please note that baggage fees on travel days are the responsibility of the student, although um, I believe all international flights are uh, that is included in the airfare, it would just be for the small domestic flights between places. So yeah, like I said, lots of things. How do you fit this all in? Um, really stick to the packing list. We are fine tuning this every year, every semester that we run a program. And you will have the opportunity to, at the end, to give us feedback on the packing list. Was there too much of this, too little of this? What did or didn't you use? So please stick to the packing list. I highly recommend using Ziplocs or stuff sacks something to allow you to organize your pack. So I might use, um, Ziplocs are just great because they're cheap. You can see what's in them. You can really suction them down and zip them tight. Um, there are compression sacks that you can get that are super helpful or packing cubes. I usually put, you know, one of those for, um, you know, maybe socks, one for underwear, one for t-shirts, one for shorts. Um, I tend to use those for those sorts of things. That way when you say, okay, I need, an, I need a shirt, I need this, you can just pull it out. It's super easy to identify where your things are. And then I personally like to take any other bulky items and kind of like pack them in around those packing cubes. So you really want to make sure that you're utilizing all of the space in that pack. Um, if you have your pack all packed up, and you're like, gosh, you can't fit anything and there's loose material on the sides, you can probably fit more in there. So there's definitely ways to kind of finagle it, um, get your system down. I would also recommend using your day pack, that small pack that would go on the front as your overflow or carry on bag. Um, so I usually like to keep my valuables in there so that they're with me on my person while I'm traveling um, or hard to pack items you could put in there. You should also, um, you, you know, if you need to wear bulky items on the plane, like your hiking boots or your sweatshirt and your puffy jacket, um, you know, wear them on the plane or in a worst case scenario, you could get a little grocery bag for overflow that you really can't fit. Get it to Miami and your instructors can help you fit it in. They are packing wizards. I promise it's possible. So you can always do that in worst case scenario, but it is, you can fit it. I believe in you. Um, and also for toiletries, I don't think there's really any need to bring massive, big shampoo, conditioner, soap. Um, bring a midsize if you can. There will be opportunities to replenish throughout, um, but no need to bring massive bottles and kind of uh, carry that weight with you the entire time. Okay, so COVID protocols. Hopefully by now you all have seen our COVID protocols document that we have sent. Um, I sent an email uh, likely a few weeks ago to all of you um, outlining that as well as attaching the new PDF of our COVID protocols as, a, as an attachment to that. So I highly recommend taking another look at that if you had not yet. But the key points here are that we are requiring all students and instructors to be fully vaccinated for COVID-19 prior to arriving on your ARC gap semester. So that means at least, you know, two weeks out from your second dose of your vaccine um, before the program begins. And we do need to receive documentation of your full vaccination status two weeks prior to it beginning. So I, I, that's about now we would like to see your COVID vaccination cards uploaded into the online portal as soon as possible. Um, additionally to this, and I am going to send an email with more information about this, so hopefully I don't want this to startle anyone, um, but with the entry to Peru, the first destination on this program, Peru right now is requiring proof of a negative PCR test within 72 hours of travel, 
Um, so when the flight departs out of Miami, which is going to be 8.30 p.m. Eastern time on September 2nd, again, this will all come in an email, um, or a negative antigen test within 24 hours of flight departure um, for entry to Peru. So that is something that you will need to coordinate before the program begins. Um, any more testing is so readily available. Hopefully that's no issue, but if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. And again, I will send an email with more info. So um, while on the program, basically, we do recommend being as careful as you can in the lead up to the program. You know, even if vaccinated, there, there can be breakthrough cases. We definitely recommend trying to be as careful as you can in the lead up to the program beginning. And then upon arrival to the airport in Miami, the instructors will be administering um, a COVID antigen test. So assuming that all those results are negative, and obviously at that point you would have needed to get a negative result from your um, pre-program testing, uh, then the, the group will then maintain or um, assume a family unit traveling as a pod, basically. So you'll be masked, obviously, through all of your travels to get down to Peru. Um, but after that, you will kind of become a family unit. There will be COVID-19 testing as needed on the program. So if for some reason a student is experiencing symptoms or anything like that, um, and we need to get them tested, we would communicate with families and let you know, but would arrange for testing as needed during the semester. Um, and Right now, there is no testing requirement for entry to Ecuador, just full vaccination. But if that changes, that would be one scenario that students might need to get a routine test on program, um, as well as to fly back to the United States. That is a, a requirement now to return. So we will make sure they get tested before they come home. Um, and then during the program, we are especially you know, even though we're all going to be vaccinated on this program, um, out of respect for the communities that we're traveling in, you know, Peru and Ecuador are both moving pretty quickly through vaccinating their population. Ecuador in particular is being second fastest right now in Latin America behind Chile. Um, Peru is, is behind, but they are rolling out their vaccine. We want to be as careful as we can out of respect for the communities we're interacting with, as well as to, for your own health and safety. So we are going to be masking, you know, whenever we're in the presence of outsiders while we're traveling. Um, there's going to be plenty of time that you guys are in your own accommodations or in spaces just with your group or you're outdoors and distance from people where you will be able to unmask. Um, but something to be mindful of, too, is especially in Peru, they do right now have a regulation that anytime you're in public, you must wear a face mask and face shield. So we will be adhering to those policies. You will need to do that for your travel down to Peru. The, the flights will require it. Um, but we are providing face masks or face shields to you. So no worries about getting those ahead of time. ARC will provide them. Um, but those are just some of the protocols that will be in place. And we obviously want to do whatever our partners are most comfortable with following their protocols to make sure that we're being respectful. Additionally, on the program, generally we will be following healthy hygiene practices. So, you know, cleaning surfaces, cooking gear, no sharing water bottles and food. Just try to be as careful about that as we can. Maintaining that family unit independent of others outside of the group or the other ARC groups. Um, you know, we're going to do our best to limit density in sleeping areas, physical distancing, um, and obviously masking up and, and kind of following our protocols if for some reason a student in the group were to show signs of, um, you know, COVID-19 and just following local regulations, especially, so wanting to be respectful there. So if a student for some reason is exhibiting any of the following symptoms during the program, such as, you know, a fever of 100.4 or higher, chills, cough, unusual muscle pain, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, um, or a newfound loss of, of smell or, or taste um, or a sore throat, then we would, you know, immediately isolate that student from the group um, and have one of the leaders kind of be dedicated to the care of that student. Um, we would have everybody else mask up and kind of determine from there, okay, do we need to, we're going to, you know, get that student tested. This, the group will be traveling with rapid antigen tests. So if something comes up, they're ready to, you know, administer one of those. Obviously, if positive, then we'd go get um, probably a PCR test or something. Does the rest of the group need to be tested? Um, so we would definitely, you know, consider all of the different options, communicate with families that this is going on, um, determine whether or not that student needs to seek further medical support for any reason. Um, do we need to send in more staff to help? Does that student need to be um, have their care resumed, you know, by somebody else, um, a parent or guardian, if it is a more long-term thing. So um, all of those things, obviously, we would be communicating with families very regularly about, but these are the protocols we would follow if for some reason that happened. Um, additionally, yes, we would be, you know, disinfecting all of the accommodation vehicles, anything that's been frequently trafficked by the symptomatic student, um, trip operations are put on pause. Um, 
like I mentioned, one, one instructor would be dedicated to the care of that student. So um, we would follow all these protocols and communicate really regularly with you. Our uh, on the ground partners are also very ready to step in if for some reason um, this is happening, they would help with any accommodation, transportation, getting a student to a clinic if necessary, um, whether COVID related or not, our on the ground partners are great assets for us here. Okay, so now on to more fun stuff. If you do have any other questions about the COVID protocols, um, please take a look at the document that should be on the portal as well as was sent in an email. Okay, so travel to ARC at the beginning of the program. How can you avoid losing your bag? This is, I think, sometimes the most, um, or could be really nerve wracking to be in the program if your bag for some reason doesn't arrive. Um, it very rarely happens, but definitely really important to check the status of your flight to Miami ahead of time get to the airport in plenty of time ahead of your flight boarding and make sure your bag is checked to Miami. The flight to South America has a different itinerary, so you should only check through to Miami. Um, keep your baggage tag, that receipt, that little, you know, scannable thing just in case you need it for some reason. Um, and we do recommend having trip insurance just in case something happens. They are really helpful in locating lost baggage. So how will you meet your instructors? For students who are flying in, you will be arriving to Miami on September 2nd between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. Um, this is to allow plenty of time for the 8.30 departure out of Miami. You will just head straight to your baggage claim to meet your instructors. They'll be wearing ARC GAP t-shirts and they will take you to the meeting location to convene with your group. Um, we do make sure that students call home as soon as they've linked up with ARC instructors to say, I'm here, I'm good, I'm safe, um, before we collect phones and begin the no, no tech time, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, this is also where instructors will collect the passports and COVID-19 vaccination cards. Um, as a note here, I'm not sure that everybody knows this, but we are actually going to have two groups traveling to South America this fall. Um, at, a couple of weeks ago, we had to make the tough decision to cancel our Asia program. And um, basically all of those students have moved into what is now a second South America group. So you all won't be overlapping in your itineraries at all. Um, it will just be the major international flight days. You'd be on the same flight. Um, but just so you know, as you are flying in, there will be four instructors kind of working together to collect students. And then they'll take you back to the meeting location where you'll start breaking up into your two separate groups and getting to know your group mate. And all of that information about your trip specific itinerary and your instructors will come tomorrow in your pre-semester packet. And then for any students who are being dropped off by parents, please call the ARC office on September 2nd for the updated um, meeting location in Miami. Uh, it will be kind of dependent with COVID where we go. They often try to do meeting outside where the groups start convening. Um, sometimes that's in a parking garage. So just give us a call on that day and we can let you know where the group is convening so that you can go and um, drop your student off. And the drop-off time is between 5 and 5.30. As mentioned, the groups will be there. You know, the instructors will be there starting at 2 p.m. if they need to be dropped off earlier. We do the later drop-off time because by then, ideally, all the instructors are back from, um, you know, gathering students that are flying in, and then you can meet both of the instructors. But if you need to drop them off earlier, you can. So flight information. Um, as I mentioned, all the groups will travel together for the international locations. Um, you know, between Miami and Peru, and then between Peru and Ecuador, and back to the States. Um, some of the internal flights will just be with your group, but all of those flights, the group does travel together with their group on an international ticket, um, group ticket, so they will be traveling together to all of those locations. Um, and as I mentioned, that flight departs out of Miami at 8.30 p.m. on September 2nd, and all of the flight information will be sent out in the detailed itinerary tomorrow. And then for the end of the program, students flying out will depart Miami on November 10th between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. Um, Eastern time. And if you're being picked up by parents, then uh, parents can just wait outside of the customs exit of the international terminal on November 10th when the flight arrives. Right now, it's set to be very early in the morning. Actually, I think it's a 5.15 a.m. arrival. Um, but you can meet them there once they've cleared customs. That'll take a little bit of time. Additionally, all of this flight information does live in the online part portal in a document titled Travel Guidelines. So if you need to reference any of this, it also lives there. Okay, so more semester-specific information. Some fun facts about the places that you're going to be traveling to. So Spanish is the official language of both Ecuador and Peru. And both of those countries are on central standard time and should be for the duration of the fall program or close to whenever daylight savings happens. But um, central time... Uh, the climate is going to be, you know, hopefully in Peru, pretty dry and sunny. Um, it gets kind of cool in the evening. You are at altitude. Um, you're up in the Andes for the vast majority of that, of that section of the program. So, you know, it'll get cool at night, dry, crisp mountain air, um, daily high temperatures around 67 degrees or so. So, um, and not getting too cold at night, but definitely you'll want to have those layers. 
And then the weather in Ecuador, um, you know, kind of similar when you're in the Andes, when you're in the Amazon for those, you know, just over a week or so, it will be hot, it will be super humid, um, as well as in the Galapagos, it'll be pretty hot and humid. Um, but mostly you'll have a mixture of those two stints of hot humidity and then otherwise just kind of dry, crisp mountain air. Where will you be staying? So your accommodations are going to be a mixture of small hotels and hostels um, when you're in major city centers. You will be doing some group community stays right now. Unfortunately, with COVID, we are not planning on home stays, but you will still have that immersive community group stay opportunity. Um, and then you will have some camping, primarily with the Llama Pack project in Peru, as well as during the, um, during the trek in Peru. You will be traveling by a mixture of, you know, obviously airplanes for those international um, travels, private buses. We are doing all private transportation for the fall program with COVID. So you will have private buses um, with one driver who's driving our groups during that time. And then you will have some ferries and boats on Lake Titicaca and in the Galapagos. That will be kind of fun as well. And then you will take one train, not mentioned here, um, to get to Machu Picchu. You will take the Inca Rail through the Sacred Valley to get to Aguas Calientes. What will you be eating? So we are, on um, this program, almost all of your meals are going to be prepared by our local partners. So you are going to be eating local cuisine um, that is, you know, Peruvian, Ecuadorian. Um, it might not be exactly like what you're used to at home, but it all is going to be fresh, healthy, and safe to eat. Um, you will have some opportunities for more kind of American or comfortable foods for you, um, but I do encourage you to really jump into that and eating the local cuisine and trying it to, yeah, get the most out of the experience. Some keys to staying healthy. So as I mentioned, traveler sickness is something that we do see on this program. And I wanna make sure that everyone is doing your part um, to make sure that you're keeping yourself healthy and, and not self-care. So um, drinking plenty of water, um, it will be all you know either bottled, boiled, or purified. We do have you on the packing list bringing your own water purification. So to avoid buying a bunch of bottled water while we're traveling, that's not very environmental. You are going to be purifying your water. Um, taking asbestos, as I mentioned, a probiotic. Um, the general rule of thumb here is boil it, cook it, peel it, or forget it. So if there's anything like raw vegetables, I would not recommend eating salads. It might have been washed with local water, and if it's not cooked out, that could make you feel sick. Um, you know, these are just bacteria that our bodies aren't used to. The locals can eat it without problem, but um, it is, you know, we, your, our stomachs just aren't quite used to it. So that's important. Um, any fruit that you might buy that you can't peel, I wouldn't eat. Um, no smoothies or any drinks with ice in them that might be made with um, unpurified water. So those are just things really important to keep yourself healthy. Um, let's see here. Yeah, well, obviously washing your hands, um, wearing a mask whenever you're interacting with anyone beyond the group, not sharing foods or anything like that, um, general self-care. But yeah, definitely be mindful of there's going to be some things that our bodies just aren't used to. We want to make sure you're healthy and able to experience the semester to the fullest. So cultural sensitivity, this is another um, piece of this that is super important when traveling in, you know, anywhere internationally and different from our home communities, but especially in the places that you're going to be traveling to, the kind of cultural norms around dress are different. And so we are going to be asking you to dress more conservatively for much of the semester. There will be certain times where it's appropriate to wear, you know, for ladies, maybe shorter shorts or whatever it might be. But for the most part, um, it is really important to be wearing, you know, longer shorts or skirts or pants to not be wearing kind of raggedy cut off t-shirts and things um you know leggings are pretty common in these regions so i do think there's going to be plenty of times where for ladies like leggings are going to be appropriate um but there might be times where they're not so please be mindful that there's there might be times that your instructors say hey i need you to put on something different and change this isn't appropriate for where we are right now um and it's super important to just be you know sensitive and uh, respectful of the communities that we are traveling in. So I would definitely recommend, yeah, looser fitting pants, skirts, um, lightweight and synthetic fabric is just easier. It keeps you cool. Um, and especially if it's a hot day and you're working hard on a project or something like that. So um, yeah, just something that we really want you to keep in mind as you're packing. So for showers and laundry, you will have opportunities to, to shower, to do laundry throughout the semester. You likely won't have a chance to shower every day. There might be some accommodations where that's available, but you might also be sharing that with your with your group mates, part of group living. So um, important to just be mindful of that. Then you won't be able to probably shower as often as you do at home, but there will be plenty of opportunities to do so. Additionally, sometimes 
that shower might not look like what you're used to at home. It might mean that you are taking a bucket bath, which is where there's like a big thing of water and you're using a bucket and kind of pouring that on yourself to take your bath or shower. So um, it might be different than what you're used to, but it's good to understand how people might live in the regions that you're traveling. Um, there could, yeah, be several days in the semester without a shower. There will be laundry opportunities um, throughout, I would say roughly every two weeks or so, you might have an opportunity to do a more formalized laundry service, such as um, you know, either paying somebody to do your clothes for you, wash them, you know, dry them, fold them for you um, is what you'll probably see most often. There might be some laundromats available at times, but in between that, you're going to be probably learning to hand wash your clothes as is pictured here. So, um, you know, a great skill to have and it definitely allows you to wash a few items here and there as you need them um, during the semester. So prepare for that. Um, and you will learn how to do that. Yes. And for students who do menstruate, uh, I'm happy to talk about Diva Cups as our great travel companion. So for calling home, as I mentioned, students will call home as soon as they meet up with their instructors in Miami. Um, upon safe arrival abroad, I will send an email to family saying, hey, they made it, met, they've met up with our partners, they're heading to their accommodations, et cetera. So, because um, students won't have their phones anymore, but they will call you upon arrival. Otherwise, the first few weeks of the semester are totally tech-free. Um, students should know this. We've talked about it in your interviews. But the purpose behind this is really to allow you to set up a group culture that is not surrounded by, you know, social media and phones and distractions. We've also found that students are most likely to get homesick in those first three weeks of the semester. So, um, you know, by taking that away, students are present, um, you know, getting to know one another without those distractions. And during that time, we will keep a, a blog um, throughout the whole semester. The login instructions for that will be sent tomorrow in the pre-semester packet. Um, but so you will get updates. You'll get to see photos and things like that. But please don't expect to speak with your student during this time. If for some reason something comes up and you need to get a hold of them, you can absolutely call us in the office and we could get in touch with our instructors if needed. Um, but otherwise, after that, students will get their phones back and set up expectations within the group for how they want to interact with their technology moving forward. And then they are responsible for holding themselves and each other accountable to that. If you do use your phone for music, I might recommend bringing an alternative source for music like an iPod Shuffle or Touch or something. Um, just no Wi-Fi enabled devices for that. And otherwise, students will have plenty of opportunities over Wi-Fi to communicate with home once they have their phones back. Please don't expect to hear from them every day. There will be plenty of times where they're, they are totally out of service, out of Wi-Fi range, um, but you can always call us if you need something. And if it is out after hours and an emergency, um, I do stress emergency, but you, we have a 24-hour emergency line all the time whenever we have students in the field. So you can always call that number if you have an emergency and need to get in touch with your student. Um, that information will also be sent in the pre-semester packet tomorrow. So for electronics on the program, like I mentioned, you can bring a cell phone. Um, some students choose to buy a little burner phone in country, cheap flip phone, um, get a local SIM card, and that is definitely an option if you're wanting to go a little bit less techy on this. Um, our recommendation for students is to bring your own phone without an international plan. So the reason for this is you could get an international plan, but often they don't have great service a lot of the places that the students are traveling to. And it allows students to be kind of in touch more than, it doesn't allow them to unplug as much as is really helpful for them on this experience to really be present. So if a student does not get an international plan, basically they'd keep their phone on airplane mode, there's no charges for it, and then whenever they get to Wi-Fi, they could put it on Wi-Fi and use it for, you know, WhatsApp, iMessage, FaceTime, email, any other, you know, methods of communication. So that is what we do recommend for students. Um, Otherwise, I would definitely recommend bringing a camera or, you know, GoPro if you want. I know many students use their, um, do use their phones for that. Instructors will be taking a lot of photos in those first three weeks just to ease any nerves. So you will be getting all of those um, at the end of the program in the Google Photos album. Um, if you read a lot, I recommend bringing a Kindle. It's great. You can get lots of books on it. Um, a lot of times students like to bring at least one, you know, paperback or hard copy real book. Um, to read and then you can share that amongst your group mates as well. So kind of create a little book club, which can be fun. Um, and then a laptop or a tablet, if you are taking college credit, this might be helpful or if you need it for some reason, um, you will not be able to use it in the first three weeks and you are obviously in charge of the kind of safety and security of carrying that around during the semester. Um, some students instead opt to bring a Bluetooth keyboard for using their phone to type if they're needing to, you know, work on some project from home. So that's also an option. For charging, there will be definitely, you know, opportunities to charge your batteries. There might be some places you're staying where you don't have access for a week, and then you have somewhere where you can charge every day. So it will just kind of depend 
I do recommend bringing extra batteries or some people choose to bring a solar charger or something like that, which is great. Um, but most places in Ecuador and Peru are going to use the same power sockets as you would use here. So no need to bring any adapters for that. Um, you might need a converter, most likely. I don't think that you will, um, but there will be plenty of opportunities to charge things during the semester. So trip updates, there, like I mentioned, there is a group blog, um, so there will be plenty of, you know, stories and journals, sometimes written by the students, um, which is fun. The leaders of the week sometimes write that, which is great. So you will be getting those updates throughout the semester, especially in those first three weeks. Um, plenty of photos and things. Sometimes students should do video blogs, which are kind of fun. So you will get plenty of updates, and the directions to access the blog for each individual group will be sent in the pre-semester packet. So how much money should you bring? Um, everything is included in your tuition with the exception of these things listed here. So any personal souvenirs or gifts that you're choosing to bring would be an additional cost. Um, cell phone or phone card if you choose that route. Laundry, um, any extra snacks. The group, the instructors will be providing snacks during the program. So there will be plenty of snacks included um, as well as, you know, three full, fulfilling meals a day. But if you're somebody who wants, you know, to get ice cream every day or a bunch of candy or additional snacks to what we're offering, that would be um, at your own discretion. Um, any emergencies, if something is lost, if someone does get sick and there's a clinic visit or something, um, that would be an additional cost. Any COVID testing that happens on, on program, with the exception of that first test at the airport, that is going to be covered by ARC, but otherwise, um, any as-needed COVID testing during the semester would be at the responsibility of the families. And then luggage fees, as I mentioned. So we do recommend that students have, you know, roughly $450 to $600 um, on a debit card, not in cash. We suggest you maybe bring $50 in cash that you could exchange when you get there or for travel days. And then once you get to Peru, you will be able to go to an ATM and take money out in the local currency. Um, so that is an option. Um, and I definitely recommend letting your bank know in advance that you will be traveling in both Ecuador, Peru, and the Galapagos, just so that they don't shut down your card once they see transactions happening abroad. All right, so now to chat a little bit more about the curriculum, just so that you all know what to expect during the semester. So as you all know, we have discussed this on the, um, you know, in all of your student interviews, but as, a, as another overview, we do have six global themes that you are learning about throughout the course of your semester, and they're all listed here. Um, so basically any of the projects that you're going to be doing are ideally looking at one or two of these six global themes. I realize it still says five, we used to have five, we've added and adapted them this year, so now we have six themes. So you are going to be learning about these throughout the program. I will say this semester is going to focus a little bit more on environment conservation just with COVID and what has been most responsible to do during this time. Um, but there will be plenty of opportunities for you to, you know, we do have one, a couple of education projects and all of these are so interconnected. You will learn about all of them. So the way that you're learning is primarily through the hands-on projects on the program. Um, this is really meant to be an experiential education semester. It's not meant to be academic or like school, um, but it is meant to be educational. We want you to learn more about the places that you're going and the things that you're doing than just being your average tourist or traveler in these regions. So there's the hands-on experiences. And then to supplement that, there is something that we call a course reader, which is basically a series of short articles and readings about each of the projects so that you can ideally you know, get some background knowledge, come in with some prior, you know, wherewithal about where you are, what you're doing. Um, in addition to that, you might be watching, you know, TED Talks or documentaries or listening to podcasts and things. Um, but the rest is discussion-based. So really having critical thinking discussions with your group about all that you're seeing and experiencing. Um, there will be some guest speakers, whether that's through our partners and projects or other guest speakers that are brought in. And then you will do some journaling. Some of that will be more topic based of, um, you know, some of the topics you're experiencing during the program. Some of that will also be more personal reflection and development, you know, reflecting on the experiences that you're having and how, how they're impacting you. So a mixture of those. And then um, the final kind of piece of this is what we call our capstone passion project. So this is basically an opportunity for students to pick any topic or theme that is of most interest to them. They research that throughout the course of the semester. And it doesn't have to be one of the six themes that I just mentioned. It could be really anything that they're just excited to learn more about, um, ideally somehow correlated or related to the um, reaches that you're traveling through. But you research it throughout the semester, ideally not through internet research, because you could do that from home, but through those interviews and observations and working with our partners. And then you give a presentation at the end of the semester that can take any creative form that you want. So we've had students in the past do everything from Oh gosh, we've had documentary little film shorts, we've had paintings, we've had photography series, 
we've had board games and uh, cookbooks. I had a student once who wrote a theater manuscript. So really meant to be speaking to your creative interests, your passion, something that you are excited to learn more about and dig more deeply into during the semester. And then finally, our another kind of section of our curriculum is our leadership development curriculum. So basically the way this works, you are going to be stepping into leadership positions during the program, leading your peers. We have this thing called Leader of the Week, which is basically where you and another one of the students will team up as co-leaders to be leaders of the week um, for five to seven days or so, where you are working closely with the instructors to, um, you know, maybe it's communicate with our partners. When is the bus coming? What are we doing tomorrow? Um, what does the group need to bring for the day's activities? Um, you know, we've got free time this afternoon. What are we going to do with it? Um, there are going to be evening circles or meetings, whether that's a curriculum discussion or it might be, you know, leaders of the week will dictate that. Maybe it's a game night. Maybe it's a go around question, getting to know one another. Um, it might be a leadership activity or initiative, which will be um, a big piece of this, doing some of that to understand your leadership style, various leadership philosophies, um, goal setting, giving and receiving feedback, learning more about that, conflict resolution. Um, all of those are pieces of this leadership curriculum. And then the final piece and kind of culmination of it all is the student planned module. And this is going to be about five days, both groups in Peru, where you as students need to come up with, you know, you're given a budget, you're given parameters, and you need to figure out where you're going, what you're doing, how you're getting there, what are you eating, um, all of the logistics that you are in charge of. And you have to work together. Your instructors come with you. It is still part of the ARC experience. But you're in charge of figuring it out, so kind of learning some of those, um, you know, teamwork, collaboration, as well as independent travel skills. So that's the brief overview of our leadership curriculum. All right, so now on to some more, um, you know, fun highlights of each of the pieces of your itinerary. Um, I will go ahead and preface that each group, like I mentioned, there's two groups. They will do these in a different order, one another, um, but you will do all of these same projects, both groups. So don't take this as the order that you'll be doing it. You will get your itinerary tomorrow. So starting with Peru, um, you will spend just over half of the semester in Peru, primarily in the Sacred Valley, um, super, super beautiful. And one of the first things that each group will do in the first couple weeks is the language school. So this is basically, you've got five days of language classes. You will be split up into beginner, intermediate, and advanced classes um, with you know individualized instructors that are working with you. Um, it's beautiful, it's in the town of Lamai. You'll be out in, you know, in the Sacred Valley, in the mountains, doing your classes outside and staying in these beautiful guest houses. Um, so super, super pretty um, and a great way to kind of dive into that language opportunity, um, you know, early in the semester and start getting your footing with the Spanish language and then practicing that with each other and with our hosts and with your teachers while you're at the language school. Um, also during this time, you'll do some kind of local visits, um, learning about the daily life of the you know farmers in the region um, and doing some other and a traditional Andean ceremony that our partner has put together so also some cultural immersion here. So Sacred Valley Exploration and Machu Picchu. So this is going to be um, oh gosh a few days. This is both the Lar or I'm sorry the Lara's trek is part of this, um, but you will be doing some a various exploration of you know Incan ruins in this area. Um, you will have a few days in Cusco to really get acclimated to, to this region of Peru. Um, you are gonna be at altitude, you're flying to Cusco at roughly 11,000 feet. So, you know, acclimating to that, exploring, and then obviously visiting Machu Picchu. Absolutely stunning, and right now in particular is a super unique time to be visiting Machu Picchu since they are still doing limited capacity at the ruins. You, um, I think right now they're maybe allowing 500 people a day and it's normally 3,000. So um, our spring groups that were there said it felt like they had the entire site completely to themselves. It was absolutely magical. So um, really unique time to be visiting. The Llama Pack Project is an awesome organization that we just started partnering with earlier this year. And basically they are um, working to promote the sustainable use of llamas as pack animals in the Peruvian Andes. So what this does is not only is it more sustainable for the actual ecosystem in these regions um, and helping for you know sustainable stewardship of these lands, but actually it's a great source of economic empowerment for some of these rural communities, people that, you know, otherwise maybe weren't working in tourism, if they can work in tourism and use llamas for trekking and things like that, um, it's a source of economic empowerment for them as well. 
Um, so it'll be part learning about the llama project. You will get to work actually with llamas as pictured here. Um, you'll be camping during this section and also helping with a construction project in the community. So, um, you know, both working and getting, getting your hands dirty in that sense, as well as, um, you know, working with llamas more directly. So the Laura's Trek, this is a three day, two night overnight backpacking excursion. This is not the Inca Trail, but it's basically like a back route into Machu Picchu. So you will do this kind of right before you head to Machu Picchu, both groups and different, you know, parts, but you will do them in that order. Um, it's super beautiful. Our spring groups absolutely loved it. You will have local porters and guides that you are traveling with. Um, it's not supposed to be super strenuous, but you know, it might be a little outside your comfort zone getting, getting active and, and, you know, backpacking for this time. Um, it's, it's just absolutely stunning. So you will be camping for this section as well during the trek. Next is the Peruvian Hearts Education Project. So um, this is one that we are really excited to bring back. We've been kind of on hiatus since COVID, but um, it's such a fantastic nonprofit organization. Um, it was a, founded by a young girl who was adopted from an orphanage in Peru to a nice family that lived in Colorado. And at one point, they decided to go back and have her, you know, visit, learn about her heritage, visit the orphanage that she came from, and she decided she wanted to do something about this. So she started a nonprofit, her name's Anna Dodson, and her brother, Danny, is now who runs it, and um, started a nonprofit to promote educational opportunities for girls in Peru. So um, they have a Peruvian Scholars Program that's sending, you know, first-generation students to college in Peru. Um, we will have the opportunity to do one, a refurbishment project for a local home of one of the Peruvian scholars. So um, oftentimes there's, you know, many children, lots of people living in these homes, and they're, they're not always the most well kept. So we are able to go in and, and through, um, through the organization, do a refurbishment project, and then also do a couple of days of like shadowing the girls, doing a picnic, playing soccer, kind of hearing their life stories and such of these. Um, it'll be the Peruvian scholars, the girls that are the same age as our students, 18 going to college. So um, really meaningful project here. And then our final stop in Peru is Lake Titicaca, where the students will be doing a couple of different things here. Um, Lake Titicaca is the largest high altitude lake in the world. So the groups are going to take um, buses from the Sacred Valley down to, down to um, Puno is the name of the town where you will be based. Um, we will do one day of going out to visit the Uros floating islands. These are about 40 islands that have been built out of Totoro Reef, as pictured here, and people live on them in the middle of the lake. It is incredible, these communities that they have built. So we get to go do a tour um, of the islands. Obviously, again, with COVID in mind, being super mindful of that, but we will get to do a tour um, and do some kayaking on Lake Titicaca. Um, we will also visit the Isla Taquil, which is um, another remote, actual, not floating, but actual island in Lake City, Kaka, um, where the men are known for knitting all these fantastic, you know, hats and scarves and gloves and things. Um, so some different, like, immersive opportunities in the Lake City, Kaka region. So um, in kayaking, kind of soaking up our final bits of Peru. And next on to Ecuador. So the groups will, from, you know, wherever they end in, in Peru, fly down to Quito. Um, and there are a few, again, different orders of things here, but um, many different highlights of the Ecuador section as well as the Galapagos is included here. So both groups will have some time just in Quito doing exploration. So walking the cobblestone streets, um, you will do a full guided tour. So, um, you know, getting to go out with one of our local guides and experts just to learn more about kind of a cultural orientation to the region, um, understand the history of Quito and such. Um, we will also visit the Mita de Mundo Museum, which is the middle of the world, you know, Ecuador is named from the equator. So students actually visit the equator itself, which I went, gosh, six years ago when I led this program. And it's so cool. It's kind of um, it's a little bit quirky, the museum itself, but it shows you all these different cool things you can do only on the equator. So you can balance an egg on a nail, or you can watch the water kind of flush through a t tunnel in different directions on either side of the equator. Um, so you can do all those fun things. And then the group will also do the ride up the gondola, up to Pichincha Volcano just outside of the city, um, get that kind of bird's eye view of Quito. Uh, really, really special place. So next is Cotopaxi and Banya. Um, these are two kind of more adventuresome stops that we're going to be doing in Ecuador, but pictured here is Cotopaxi Volcano. It is one of the largest strata volcanoes in South America. Um, it is still active, although right now it's, you know, it's safe to go to at this time. Um, and it is the second highest peak in Ecuador. So groups will go do a kind of guided tour 
learning about the volcanic history. It's kind of a quintessential landmark of Ecuador. Um, they'll get to hike up to the snow line, um, learning about the kind of flora and fauna in the region and kind of, yeah, why, why Cotopaxi has been so important to Ecuador. Um, and then also going to Baños. So Baños is a really fun um, town that has tons of outdoor exploration activities nearby. So the group will do some hiking. Um, they will go to what's pictured here. It's called the Swing at the End of the World. It's a great photo op. It's kind of fun. And then they will also go whitewater rafting on the Pasaza River while in Van Bonio. Next, heading into the Amazon. So this is, like I mentioned, going to be about nine or ten days of the program. Um, this is an awesome organization that we have been working with for a number of years now called um, Kayari. And they are doing a couple different things here. Their main focus is cacao farming and using basically making artisan chocolate as an economic empowerment tool for these really remote communities in the Amazon. So we're going to be learning about the cacao farming, how they're promoting this economic um, you know, stability for these communities, you know, tasting the chocolate. You'll go to their little shop where they actually sell the chocolate, but it actually is, I think, um, shipped all over the world. And then also learning about petroleum drilling and how that's been impacting the communities in the Amazon, you will learn about the kind of well-known um, Texaco oil spill back from the 90s that is still impacting these communities today. So a major environmental and public health crisis in this region. Um, so learning about both of those, and we will do a sort of group community stay, um, you know, getting to immerse yourself in these really unique communities that are very far off the grid. And lastly, the Galapagos Islands. So you will then take a flight from Quito out to, um, you're flying into one, it, it, the groups are doing opposite orders, but both groups do get to end in the Galapagos just because it's such a fantastic place to end the semester. Um, one group will start flying into Baltra, one group will start flying into San Cristobal, and then they will switch. But you will have a few different projects and opportunities here. So one is you are going to be, you know, obviously learning the, the history here, visiting the Charles Darwin Museum, um, you're going to get to go snorkeling and kayaking, um, you know, learning about the massive biodiversity here and the many animals and such. Um, and then also doing some service projects. So the groups will do um, two different service projects. One will be volunteering in an equine therapy um, location for a day. So they're doing horse therapy for, um, you know, kids with disabilities. So learning more about that. Um, through our local partners, and then additionally doing a reforestation project, um, working with native native plant species and such. Um, so learning more about that, and also just wrapping up the semester, presenting capstone projects, discussing re-entry back into the United States, um, and getting ready to to head home. Alrighty, so those are all of the highlights of the program. We did have a few questions that came in, so I will just go over those here. So in terms of instructors, you will be getting bios for your group's specific instructors tomorrow, um, but three of our four instructors have led GAP semesters for us before, um, and the other one has is new to ARC but brings extensive experience and knowledge um, working for a variety of different outdoor ed companies. Um, but they're all well-traveled, they are educators at heart, they are passionate about this, um, and they do all have their Wilderness First Responder Certification, which is an 80-hour backcountry medical certification so that they are ready and prepared to respond to any medical emergencies that might arise in the field. Let's see, there was a question about drinking water. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is all going to be, you know, clean and purified, whether that is bottled, um, you know, purchasing bottled water, boiled or, you know, somehow otherwise purified water, or the group will be mostly purifying your own water with your Sari pens or your Sawyer filters. So there was a question about the groups. We do not send a list of who is in the group ahead of time, and this is very much intentional. Um, we want everybody to come up uh, to the first day at the airport on the same page with no preconceived notions or connections from beforehand. Um, so you won't get a list. You will get a little sneak peek um, a couple of days before the program begins of, you know, who all, uh, where, where students are coming from and some fun facts about your group mates. But right now we've got students coming from, you know, kind of all over the map, but all um, from the United States. There was a question about our drug and alcohol policy. So as you all should know by now, we do have a very strict zero tolerance policy for drugs and alcohol on our programs. Um, basically the way it works is if students are caught in possession or consumption of drugs or alcohol, you do get sent home immediately at your own expense. So this is something that we do not take lightly. Um, we, will, we will adhere to this policy if something does come up on program. So please, please, please um, respect that policy while you're on the semester with us. Um, additionally, we do not allow any CBD products, especially for international travel. It is not something you want to mess with. This stuff is not legal um, abroad, so there's absolutely no CBD products. Um, and vaping and cigarettes are also not allowed. 
There's a question about mail opportunities. So there will be one opportunity for to receive mail during the semester. There will be a mail drop in Peru. I will send that information in the pre-semester packet tomorrow. Um, it's not the most reliable. I would not recommend sending anything valuable or, or perishable. Um, I would send letters, maybe a very small package, um, but most of the letters will be what makes the most sense. Um, and if it doesn't get there, it, you know, mail is not reliable um, generally in, in Latin America, um, especially since COVID. But our, right now, our partner did say that mail has been coming through, so you can certainly give it a try. There was a question about sickness. So I know we kind of talked about this earlier, but obviously we have a lot of experience with Traveler sickness and the various things that come up while traveling. Um, I will say kind of traveler's diarrhea and altitude sickness are the things that you might see most on this program. Um, our partners are a huge help here with facilitating if we need to go to a clinic. Obviously, one of the instructors would accompany students, and we always are in communication with parents during this time. Please take care of yourselves. That's the best thing you can do to prevent this. You know, make sure you're staying hydrated, you're resting enough, you're eating good foods, um, you know, you're just taking good care of yourself. That will go a long way. And obviously, anything COVID-related, we would take very seriously. Let's see, there was a question about just a day in the life. So generally speaking, this is a marathon, not a sprint. This is a semester program. So, you know, you are going to be, generally speaking, and again, every day is going to be somewhat different, but most of the time, um, you know, the leaders of the week are in charge of getting the group up in the morning in time for breakfast around 7, 7.30 maybe, somewhere in that ballpark, unless it's an early wake up for a long travel day. Um, you'll have breakfast as a group, then you'll head to whatever project or activity it is that you're doing for the day. Often you'll have, um, you know, a break for lunch, maybe around noon or one o'clock, at least an hour or so. Sometimes you'll come back for another hour or two of work in the afternoons. Um, usually there's some free time after that in the afternoon before dinner where you can, you know, go for a run, take a nap, read a book, work on your capstone project, play cards with your peers, contact home, whatever that might be. Um, dinner as a group, and then there's usually some sort of evening meeting, circle, gathering. Um, something is sometimes brief, sometimes it's longer, but you will expect that most evenings on the semester. Um, and then usually a little bit of free time before bed. Let's see, there was a question about independence. So please note that this is a group experience. You have signed up for a group semester. It is not an independent experience. So a lot of things will be done together. And in some places, it's just simply not safe to let you all wander off on your own, um, you know, especially not in pairs. Other places more rural, you might have space to, yeah, you know, go out and explore for an hour and meet back at this place, um, you know, staying in buddies or go for a run, et cetera. So this will all be determined as well by you um, and the kind of that earned and gained independence throughout the semester. Um, all right, there are some questions about changes to the itinerary. Um, right now, I, I'm in regular communication with our partners every day. We are planning to move ahead with the itinerary as you will receive it tomorrow in your pre-semester packet. But as I said, um, it, it's COVID time, things could change. And we're super ready to do that, as I hope you all saw with you know, our Asia crew moving you all over to a South America program, or when we had to make the switch from Patagonia to Ecuador about a month ago. We're ready to change things as is needed throughout the semester. We would obviously keep you fully posted if anything were to change, even small changes to the itinerary. Um, we have in the past been complimented, complimented on our communication. We do try to keep you as in the loop as we possibly can, um, but just know that we are always watching in on top of things. Um, and if anything does arise, we will let you know as Im immediately. There was also a question about college credit. So there will be time set aside for college credit during the program, um, often in that free time in the evenings, as I mentioned, or in the afternoons. Um, if you aren't aware, we do offer up to 18 quarter credit hours for students through Portland State University. If you are interested in this, Emily has sent an email about it, likely already to all of you, about college credit. But if you are interested, she is kind of the main point of contact for that. Um, but yeah, there would be time throughout the days to do that, um, you know, when students are working on capstones or things like that. Additionally, with the college credit, um, you know, if you are doing a final essay or something for one of your classes, we do allow you to do that as your capstone project for us. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, that you're doing a ton of extra work per se. Um, you could kind of kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, by doing your um, final project as your, uh, as your capstone for both. And typically, there is a bit of time after the semester is over to finish up those projects. So it doesn't need to necessarily be done um, right at the end of the semester. So, all right, I'm just going to take a look here and see if there were any other questions that came through. Um, so, it does look like there was a question about vegetarian food. Um, there will be, I have been recording anyone that tells me that they're vegetarian or has any sort of 
dietary restrictions. Um, so we will make sure that those options are available to you during the semester. Um, all right, I think that Emily is answering a few more questions here, but otherwise, like I mentioned, there is going to be a pre-semester packet getting sent out to you tomorrow, as well as a recording of this presentation. If you, you know, for some reason missed it, want to refer back to anything, um, in that pre-semester packet, you will have your group-specific itinerary, the blog access login, you know, details, um, emergency communication, so how to reach us on the emergency line, the bios for your two instructors, as well as the airport meeting form. And then your instructors will also be calling on August 30th and 31st to just introduce themselves and to answer any last minute questions that you might have. And here's our contact information if you do have any further questions. Um, I will be the main point of contact for the South America program, although I know since Emily is the director of the Asia semester and has been working most closely with our now South America B group that moved over from Asia, um, she is also a great point of contact. She's super well versed on this program. Um, so both of us can certainly serve as those main points of contact, but please feel free to reach out to me if there are any other questions after this. And otherwise, thank you one more time um, for your attention this evening. I do hope that this has been helpful, and we are very excited to meet you all in a few short weeks in Miami. And we will stay on the line for a few more minutes here to answer any lingering questions. But otherwise, we hope you have a wonderful evening.